The next four games released were the last to come out before the NES's official nationwide launch on September 27, 1986. This doesn't necessarily bear any particular significance, but I do see this stretch as Nintendo's last push to publish just a few more games to pad the NES's library. The first of these was a good example of a title that did just that. Gumshoe, the last Sapper game in the black box set and Nintendo's first American exclusive NES game. In an era where nearly every region exclusive game remained in Japan, this was a significant outlier. Why was this game different from the rest? While there are no primary sources that explain why Gumshoe was never released in Japan, by looking at Nintendo's history when it comes to region exclusive games, we can determine a few different possibilities. It's clear that the Zapper was more popular in America than Japan, at least during the time of Gumshoe's release in 1986. It's important to remember that Japan had other light gun games like Duck Hunt and Hogan's Alley in 1984, a full year before America got them on the NES. By the time Gumshoe had been released, it was nearly two full years later. The Zapper had been dropped as the peripheral of choice, instead replaced with the Famicom Disk System, released in February of 86. Nintendo put most of their effort into advertising this new add-on, meaning the light gun fell by the wayside. Cultural factors also seemed to play a significant part in Japan's abandoning of the peripheral. While shooting was certainly novel, it's such an iconically American sport that it probably didn't resonate as well with the Japanese audience, at least for longer than a couple of years. Gumshoe was just the first Nintendo published light gun game that was exclusively launched in America. Nintendo's 1990 game, Barker Bill's Trick Shooting, was also an American exclusive. If we look a bit further down the line to the Super Scope, which essentially amounted to the Zapper's sequel for the Super Nintendo, the same can be seen. It was a big part of early advertising campaigns for American audiences, but only saw a very limited release in Japan, a year after it hit store shelves overseas. So, it's entirely possible that Nintendo knew that Gumshoe would be dead on arrival in Japan. Nintendo likely felt that they had to bolster the lineup of Light Gun series games, and so they handed the job off to a relatively new designer. The game was directed and designed by Yoshio Sakamoto, the same man who brought us Wrecking Crew, Balloon Fight, and later, Metroid. Sakamoto began his work at Nintendo designing pixel art for early Game & Watch titles, most notably Donkey Kong, and even helped Miyamoto with the art for Donkey Kong Jr. His first experience with general game design came in the form of Wrecking Crew, released just a year prior to Gumshoe. Nintendo likely put the task of developing another light gun game on Sakamoto so that more experienced groups could focus on larger projects. However, even though he was relatively new to the field, every game Sakamoto touched brought new ideas to the table, and Gumshoe was no exception. Wrecking Crew experimented with puzzle mechanics that had to be planned for in advance. If certain obstacles weren't destroyed in the correct order, levels may be entirely impossible to complete. Balloon Fight brought with it a fantastic side-scrolling adventure with Balloon Trip. Metroid would go on to start its own genre of exploration-based platformers. Gumshoe was Sakamoto's interim project, and just the second game he had designed, but it too introduced a variety of interesting mechanics. The muddy release dates of the game also contribute to the theory of Gumshoe being shoehorned in when compared to other black box titles. It's been well established that Nintendo is the least reliable source when it comes to their own game's launch dates. They say that Soccer came out in 1987 when it came out in 1985, that Donkey Kong Jr. Math came out in 1985 when it certainly came out in 1986, and that Gumshoe came out in June of 1986. Well, this date kept getting pushed back. By taking a look at a couple different issues of computer entertainer newsletters between June of 1986 and October of 1986, we can see that Nintendo likely intended to get Gumshoe out with the rest of the arcade series. The release month got pushed back to July, and then to August, and it looks like it finally came out in September, according to the October issue of the magazine. These delays are the hallmark of a rushed project. I sincerely doubt Nintendo put many resources into Gumshoe, but they didn't want to ship any more incomplete messes like Donkey Kong Jr. Math or Stack Up. So, they gave Sakamoto and his team some extra time. And this was well worth it. Now, 
let's take a closer look at how Gumshoe took full advantage of the zapper. Gumshoe follows Mr. Stevenson, an ex-FBI agent turned detective, as he attempts to rescue his only daughter Jennifer, who was kidnapped. In order to do so, he must collect five Black Panther diamonds from around the world. There are four total stages, but it's quite unlikely that anybody watching this has even made it past the first. The game is extremely difficult. The player acts as Mr. Steven's babysitter. He'll move forward continuously, completely unaware of the many, many obstacles that stand in his way. It's the player's job to keep him out of trouble by shooting approaching enemies. Not being able to directly control the main character may sound familiar. In 1985, Nintendo published Gyromite, a game that includes a similar mode in its Game B. However, unlike Gyromite, in which the player can only control Professor Hector's surroundings, Gumshoe grants the player some control over Stevenson himself. The detective is actually completely bulletproof. Shooting him causes him to jump into the air, allowing him to get to high platforms and avoid oncoming vehicles. The game's difficulty arises with the sheer amount of enemies that are present on the screen at any given time. While most of them can be defeated in a shot or two, they move so quickly that accurately shooting can be really challenging. Stevenson can be shot as many times as you please, but a single hit without a power-up is enough to do him in, for some unknown reason. Also, the player has a limited amount of bullets with which to shoot enemies. This increases with every balloon popped, but it's sometimes impossible to reach these when so many birds are flying at Stevenson. In addition, the actual shooting mechanic doesn't fit the layout of the game. While aiming high on the screen, the gun's butt obscured my view of the bottom of the TV, meaning I couldn't anticipate my next move. This resulted in many a game over as I'd accidentally lead Stevenson right into a skull block upon his landing. The only saving grace is that, when you do reach a game over, you can shoot one of the letters to continue. Regardless, Gumshoe is very, very hard, not only due to the level design, but because of the physical requirements of using the zapper gun. However, it was special in more ways than one. It was the first American exclusive game in the black box set, sure, but it was also one of the few Nintendo developed black box games featuring entirely original characters that has never seen a re-release or sequel of any kind. I would pin this on its general unpopularity. By looking at what we know about its print history, we can determine that Gumshoe was one of the worst-selling black box games in the entire set. For some reason, I own every known print of this game, so here's a quick visual guide on how I came to that conclusion. The first print of Gumshoe comes with a gloss sticker seal, similar to all other 1986 releases. However, the back of the box is not the same as other second prints. Gumshoe's box has NESGP present, which is a box that came out in late 86. It's reasonable to conclude that the game used leftover stickers from earlier production, which would explain that discrepancy, but its code gives away the fact that it likely came out in the latter half of 86. The latest known print of Gumshoe is a sixth print, meaning that, on the back of the box, it has a code in the top left corner, a built-in hang tab, and a TM after NES. This print was produced in mid-1987, which means that, best case scenario, Gumshoe was around for a bit under a year. This would make Gumshoe tied with Donkey Kong Jr. Math for the black box game with the least amount of prints. Just about every other black box title, even Stack Up, saw a longer production cycle, so it can be assumed that Gumshoe just wasn't very popular. What it lacks in direct sequels and virtual console releases, it more than makes up for in influence. Gumshoe was one of the founders of the endless runner genre, along with Irem's Moon Patrol and Namco's Metrocross. Both of these games leave the horizontal movement out of the hands of the player, giving them responsibility for the shooting or jumping, and lane changing in Moon Patrol and Metrocross respectively. Gumshoe was the next step in this evolution, adding a peripheral and quite a few movement options to the mix. This genre has seen many, many entries since then. Pepsi Man, for one, comes to mind, and even went through a bit of an explosion in the early days of mobile game development. Titles such as Temple Run, Subway Surfers, Jetpack Joyride, and even Flappy Bird bear a striking resemblance to Gumshoe. Some of these are played from the first-person perspective, some in the third person, 
akin to the traditional endless runners, but something they all share in common is that they're significantly more addicting and fun than their predecessors. Nintendo's 2005 DS game, Yoshi Touch and Go, seems like an homage to Gumshoe in more ways than one. Yoshi constantly runs to the right, and the player uses the stylus to shoot down enemies and clear the path. It checks all of the boxes. It's an endless runner, it utilizes a peripheral for most gameplay mechanics, and it was developed in-house by Nintendo. It's pretty likely that the team working on this game looked through the depths of Nintendo's early NES titles and dug up some inspiration. In the end, Gumshoe is one of those games that's really hard to play, both in terms of gameplay and literal accessibility. It's not surprising that the game has faded into obscurity since its initial debut. However, it's a unique title that certainly had a sizable impact on the developing genre of Endless Runners. On a side note, the wonderful people at the cutting room floor found several unused graphics in Gumshoe's coat, including this sprite of one of King Dom's men. For some reason unknown to mankind, he is gradually becoming more and more naked. I truly wonder what happened to this, and I'm quite disappointed that it didn't make it into the final cut of the game. Well, I'll leave you guys to ponder this. Good luck.